Hello, my name is Brian France, and this is the first in a series of videos intended to help Christians answer the questions and challenges that our faith continually faces, both in our own search for the truth and as we interact with non-believers. Now, I firmly believe that the Bible contains everything a person needs to receive salvation, and I do not in any way aim to diminish the importance of faith. Ultimately, that is all that matters. But to be convinced of the Bible's dependability, it helps to test it against historical and material evidence. Thus, much of the information in this series will have to come from extra-biblical sources. It's my prayer that this series will help you carry out Peter's instructions in 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. The concept of God has been present in civilization from the earliest historical records. In ancient Egypt, the kings were believed to have been the embodiment of the gods from as far back as 3000 BC. In what is now Turkey, the Hittites worshipped gods of nature back in 1200 BC. From the mysticism of the Orient to the nature worship of the Native Americans to the pantheon of the Greeks, religion appears in the history of practically every people on the earth. It would seem that man has always accepted the concept of the supernatural, of something greater than him, and although the forms sometimes vary greatly from one group of people to another, it is nevertheless present wherever you look. This of course doesn't prove the existence of God, but it does point out an interesting fact about man. We seem to need a divine presence in our lives. Whether because we desire an answer to what we mortals cannot explain, or because we simply need there to be something greater than us, man has always felt incomplete without something or someone beyond us in which to believe. Now a modern skeptic will argue that belief in God has just been man's way of explaining what he was too ignorant to understand. Now that we have so much better an understanding of our universe, it should be clear that there is a natural explanation for everything, and that we no longer need to use God as the answer. The problem is, this isn't really true. Firstly, many of the so-called natural explanations for our existence are pretty weak. The theory of macroevolution is one of these, as we'll see later. But even more compelling, there is one thing that we will never be able to give a natural explanation for, how it all got here in the first place. We can argue all we want about whether life as we know it evolved by chance over billions of years, but we'll always have to come down to the fact that space, matter, and time are here and common sense tells us that something or someone had to put it here. The timeline of the universe is not infinite, for it grows by the millisecond. Thus, there had to be a beginning of time. Now obviously we can't go there and observe what happened, so the best we can do is theorize. But no natural theory can ever explain how something came to exist out of nothing. Brilliant people such as Stephen Hawking have wrestled with this problem for ages, and the best explanations they come up with is that the universe just is, or they have to concoct some concept of imaginary time to describe how something could exist before our universe in which a creative action could take place. We'll get into these ideas a bit more later, but the main point I'm trying to make now is that science cannot ever explain something we can't observe, like the beginning of time so it is ignorant to think that science is all we need. By itself, this doesn't lead us to belief in God, but it at least shows us that we can't figure it all out empirically. In the first several segments, I aim to show that unlike what many in the secular world will tell you, belief in a supernatural being, God, is not simply a crux that man has devised to answer what he can't understand. It makes sense logically and is actually supported by science. Ever since men like Plato and Aristotle formalized logic to help us reason correctly, rules of logic have been instrumental in man's search for the truth. When based upon true premises, logical arguments allow us to come to sound conclusions which give us a reliable and unbiased foundation upon which to build other arguments. While it may be a stretch to say that simple logic can be used to unequivocally prove the existence of something as vast as God, there are a number of formal arguments which make a rather convincing case for such a possibility. Now, Although the ultimate purpose of this study is to provide evidence for the existence of God as described in the Christian Bible, we need to start off much broader. 
The plausibility of the Bible is much easier to establish if we already have a firm basis for believing in the existence of supernatural beings. The following arguments do not address anything more than a powerful being that is beyond our comprehension. Attributes such as omniscience are topics for another discussion. The ontological or study of existence argument. St. Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury in the late 11th century, is famous for his ontological argument for the existence of God. It's found in his book titled Proslogium and is written in the form of a prayer and it makes for an interesting read. Here's a slightly abridged version. Number one, God is something than which nothing greater can be imagined. Most people would agree that this is a fair definition for God, whether or not they believe he actually exists. Number two, then is there no such nature, since the fool has said in his heart, God is not? In other words, are fools right in saying that such a being does not exist? Number three, but certainly this same fool, when he hears the very thing that I am saying, something than which nothing greater can be imagined, he understands what he hears, and what he understands is in his understanding, even if he doesn't understand that it is. Okay, this is a bit harder to follow, but it's really just common sense. Basically, even an atheist understands the concept of God, even if he doesn't understand that God actually exists. Number four, for when a painter imagines beforehand what he is going to make, he has in his understanding what he has not yet made, but he does not yet understand that it is. But when he has already painted it, he both has in his understanding what he has already painted, and he understands that it is. Here Anselm is using the analogy of a painter to explain the difference between merely understanding a concept and understanding that it actually exists. A painter understands or has in his mind what he is going to paint, but he correctly does not understand it to exist because he hasn't actually painted it yet. Once he does paint it, he understands both the concept and its existence. Number five, certainly that than which a greater cannot be imagined cannot be in the understanding alone. For if it is at least in the understanding alone, it can be imagined to be in reality too, which is greater. This is the crux of the argument. Since we understand the concept of God and can imagine something we understand conceptually to actually exist, we can therefore imagine that God exists. To imagine God actually existing is greater than simply understanding the concept of God. Number six, therefore, if that than which a greater cannot be imagined is in the understanding alone, that very thing than which a greater cannot be imagined is something than which a greater can be imagined. But certainly this cannot be. And here Anselm points out the fool's contradiction. If God is the greatest thing imaginable and only exists as a concept, then God could be imagined to exist in reality, which would be imagining something even greater. But this is a contradiction, because for us to be able to imagine something greater than God goes against our accepted definition of Him. Number seven, there exists, therefore, beyond doubt, something than which a greater cannot be imagined, both in the understanding and in reality. And this is Anselm's conclusion, that God exists. If you can follow the logic, it's pretty cool. Unfortunately, it's not particularly convincing because it sounds too hypothetical and doesn't really give any compelling evidence for the existence of God. Still, it's an interesting and rather famous argument, and it generally serves to strengthen the conviction of people who already believe that God exists. The teleological or study of design argument. Numerous philosophers, including Plato and Aristotle, have contemplated the existence of a supernatural being based on the obvious complexity of our universe. A deductive argument from design goes like this. Nature and some things in nature appear designed. Properties that appear designed are not producible without an active agent. Therefore, nature and some things in nature are products of an active agent, or designer. Now the main issue that skeptics have with this is its assumption that the complexity of nature are not producible without an active agent. 18th century philosopher David Hume argued that because man-made machines and life are so completely different, we cannot conclude that just because we know machines to be designed, the same must be true of life. While it's technically true that we have not observed something like life ever be designed, and therefore cannot conclude with certainty that life could not develop naturally, the teleo teleological argument still has probabilistic merit. Hume doesn't deny the complexity of life, 
and therefore must resort to the idea that the complexity of life got here on its own, which is where modern scientists point to the theory of evolution as a sufficient designer-free explanation for the existence of life, and thus claim that the parallel between complex machines which require a designer and life is flawed. We will explore the sufficiency of evolution as an explanation for life in a later segment. For now, let's move on to the next argument for the existence of God. The cosmological or study of the universe argument. Here's how the first cause argument goes formally. A contingent being exists, that is, something that depends on something else for its existence. This contingent being has a cause for its existence, and this cause is something other than the contingent being itself. This cause must either be another contingent being, or may include a non-contingent or independent being. Contingent beings alone cannot cause the existence of a contingent being, and therefore the cause of this contingent being must include a non-contingent being, and therefore a non-contingent being must exist. Now a non-contingent being is one which exists independent of anything else, and this is an attribute that most definitions of God include, and indeed it is not an attribute of anything that we've seen in the natural world. This first cause, this non-contingent being, must exist outside of time and be supernatural, otherwise it too would need a cause just like everything else in the universe. Objections to this argument include one by Bertrand Russell, which posits that the universe doesn't need an explanation, but that it just is. He objects to the conclusion that the universe needs a cause just because the components of the universe need causes. This is an argument that he says commits the fallacy of concluding something to be true of the whole based on it being true of the parts. In response, theists point out that the assumption that the universe requires a cause is not made simply because its components do, but because the universe has the same properties as its components that makes them require a cause, namely matter, time, and energy. They're part of our universe. Finally, someone may ask, as Stephen Hawking once did, who made God? But this is exactly the point. We understand God to be a supernatural being without cause or beginning. If he weren't, he wouldn't be God. The Moral Argument In his book Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis argues for the existence of God from a moral perspective. He observes that mankind has almost universally had some concept of right and wrong or justice, which goes beyond simple social norms or practicality, and which often contradicts our own instinct of self-preservation. This natural moral law, Lewis posits, is unlike any other law in nature, because it's the one kind of law that can be, and often is, disobeyed. The moral law is not a fact, because it's not something that we observe to always be true like the law of gravitation is. But neither is the moral law a mere idea, because there is no denying its presence in everyone. We all have some innate sense of fairness and rightness, independent of how it affects us or humanity. Now some will object to this and argue that morality is simply what serves us or society best, and that it thus needs no special explanation. Against the first idea, Lewis uses the following illustration. A man occupying the corner seat in the train because he got there first, and a man who slipped into it while my back was turned and removed my bag, are both equally inconvenient, but I blame the second and do not blame the first. I am not angry, except perhaps for a moment before I come to my senses, with a man who trips me up by accident. I am angry with a man who tries to trick, trip me up, even if he does not succeed. Yet the first has hurt me and the second has not. Sometimes the behavior which I call bad is not inconvenient to me at all, but the very opposite. To the second idea, that morals are simply whatever serves society best, Lewis points out that while true, this isn't a sufficient explanation either. If we ask, why ought I to be unselfish, and you reply, because it's good for society, we may then ask, why should I care what's good for society, except when it happens to pay me personally? And then you'll have to say, because you ought to be unselfish, which simply brings back us back to where we started. You're saying what is true, but you're not getting any further. Based on the inability to explain the practically universal existence of a conscience within human beings, Lewis concludes that its source must be something other than us, and not just a fact of our nature, because it's not consistently followed like other facts of nature. Now while the last of those arguments does come somewhat near to the Christian idea of God, none of them provide us with a basis for a religion. 
Nevertheless, these logical approaches to the concept of God's existence achieve an important task. They make the existence of some sort of supernatural being logically plausible, if not quite proven. With this as our foundation, we're ready to move into some more specific areas that, in my opinion, show us that God's existence is much more than just plausible. It is compellingly likely.